Hi, I'm Adam Natale, director of SVA Theater at the School of Visual Arts. If you've never heard of SVA, we're a preeminent art and design college in New York City. Check the description below for more info. Since 2014, SVA Theater has hosted After School Special, the college's annual alumni film and animation festival. The festival is normally a series of free screenings followed by Q&As with alumni who are successfully working in the film industry. Even though we're unable to host in-person screenings this year, we're thrilled to be able to present interviews with over 25 alumni who've worked on a wide variety of feature films, television shows, documentaries, animated films, and more. Whether tonight's Q&A focuses on a particular series, film, or other work, we'll be sure to note it in the description below and we'll provide info on how to watch. All of our festival interviews will premiere here on YouTube during the week of September 21st. We're calling this our work from home edition of After School Special, and our guests are zooming in from all over the world, from Singapore and Germany to Canada and California. A full schedule of After School Special 2020 interviews can be found at svatheater.com, but all videos will remain on YouTube following their premieres. I hope you enjoyed tonight's interview, and if you're interested in viewing past After School Special Q&As, you can visit the School of Visual Arts' YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in, and fingers crossed, we hope to see you in person at an SVA Theater event in the near future. Hi, good evening and welcome. Uh, this Q&A is dedicated to the art of documentary film editing. SVA is so proud to have many successful film editors in its alumni base, but specifically, we want to focus on documentary editing this evening. We have two of those editors uh, from our alumni base joining us. I'd like to first welcome Ann Collins, who's a graduate of SVA's MFA Art Writing Program and a faculty member of our MFA Social Documentary Program. I'd uh, next like to welcome Victor Ilyukin, who is a student of Anne's in the Social Documentary Program, which he graduated from in 2014. Uh, just a little bit about each one of them. Anne Collins is best known for her work as an editor on Griffin Dunn's documentary, Joan Didion, The Center Will Not Hold, as well as the documentaries Swim Team and the Oscar-nominated Sound and Fury. Her films have premiered at many major festivals, including Sundance, Berlin, and the New York Film Festival. Her most recent film, Ms. Diagnosed, premiered on the festival scene earlier this year, and she was one of three editors on the docu-series The Pharmacist, which premiered on Netflix to critical acclaim in February. One of the other editors I should note was Erin Yanes, who is also an SVA alumnus from our uh, undergraduate film program. Victor Olyukin served on the producing team of Elephant Path, which was acquired by PBS's World Channel and Al Jazeera, and he produced Busy Inside, which was also acquired by PBS. The latter film premiered at the Moscow International Film Festival and screened at Doc NYC, IFP Film Week at the Hamptons Film Festival, and won the Audience Award at the Middlebury Film Festival. Most recently, Victor directed Two and Twenty Troubles and edited Secret Music, both of which have been playing the festival circuit. He also served on the editing team of HBO's Welcome to Chechnya, which premiered at Sundance earlier this year, where it won a special editing award. So let's please welcome Anne and Victor. Hey to you both, thanks for being here. Thank um, you. So uh, I'd love for you first, before we delve into your film careers, I'd like to hear about your SBA experiences, you know, Anne, you and Victor met in, uh, in the social documentary film program where you were teaching him in a class and uh, you were a faculty member when you, you chose to go back and get your master's in art writing. So can you talk about that, that whole experience with SVA? Sure, um, I was working, uh, I had been working for a long time as a freelance documentary film editor here in New York. And I was good friends with Mauro Tremaya, who is the founder and chair of the Masters in Social Documentary. And Mauro called me one day and she said, I'm, I'm starting a new department at SBA. It's going to open in four years. And I want you to teach. And I said, okay, call me in 
four years and said, no, 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 I need you right now. We need to design a curriculum and I have architects at work on the space. And slowly we started to, you know, with other faculty and other people involved in the department and at SVA to build um, this new program, which was really exciting. Um, and uh, I continued, you know, working as a freelance film editor and, and teaching, um, you know, in the mornings or at night, you know, around my work schedule. Um, SVA is a school built of working professionals. Um, so I was doing that. And uh, when I would go into, um, in and out of the building, uh, there were these bookmarks and I'm a big reader. Um, so, you know, I always need a bookmark. There were these bookmarks that said, um, become one of those who notices things you know um it had this henry james quote on it and it was from the department of art criticism and writing and i used to take bookmark and think i wonder what they do in that department i wonder what they do um and after a few years of teaching um you know and really thinking about what a master's allows a person to do for two years and the intensity of working um you know in a field um you know kind of having graduated from an undergrad program and perhaps worked or perhaps had life experiences or even just coming out of an undergrad program, that sort of additional um, educational opportunity and, you know, in the case of SVA, creative opportunity um, was very intriguing to me. Um, I also, when I'm not working, I am a person who sees every museum show and walks around galleries. I've always um, loved, you know, the art scene in New York and have, um, you know, taken part in experiencing all of that. That's sort of like the first thing I do after I end a job is I go up to the Met or I go up to the MoMA or I check out, you know, I walk around Chelsea. Um, so one day I had finished a job and I started Googling masters at SVA and, and you know, kept circling back to the um, art criticism and writing now, it's the art writing uh, program, and went and met Annette Warren, um, who uh, runs the program, David Levi Strauss is the chair, and Annette is sort of the, you know, boots on the ground person. And, you know, she took me into this space, which is just this incredible room filled with books, you know, about art and of art works and things like that. And I met Levi and chatted with him and, um, you know, and, and just fell in love with the idea of spending time thinking about art and thinking about more specifically um, the image and how the image affects us and started to realize that that's what I had been doing as a film editor for, you know, close to 20 years at that point, that really, really thinking about the meaning of an image or the meaning of, you know, a clip of motion picture or, you know, the juxtaposition of music with, you know, a visual and, and how that works and how that affects us and how we, you know, in turn kind of affect meaning um, was incredibly interesting to me. And I was able to go to that department part time. Um, it took me like five years to get the master's um, and to write the thesis. Uh, and it, it was a wonderful thing because I am a big believer that, you know, artists, of any kind don't need to be limited to one domain that, you know, painters can be potters and, um, you know, architects can be bakers and, you know, and so to have a writing component um, as part of my art making practice in addition to editing was just this wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, you know, the two kind of feed each other. Um, it really changed the way I think about editing. It really changed the way I um, approach my work and it also changed the way I teach editing. So it was a wonderful kind of um, unexpected path to go down that actually integrated beautifully into everything else I do. So I'm, I'm very grateful to the School of Visual Arts for that department and I'm incredibly grateful to David Levi Strauss uh, and the art writing department for what for the ways that it changed me. Well, that's a great plug. Thank you so much. <laughs> we didn't we didn't pay for that advertisement. Hopefully, uh, YouTube YouTube won't take something off the back end. But Victor, um, you came over from Russia specifically for this program. Um, so I'd love to hear how you made that decision. And if you want to tell us about the class where you met Anne, I'd love to hear more about that. Sure. Um, I actually didn't know Anne that you were also learning at the same time as teaching like that's I new was. information not when you were there i, I did ah. it later not when you were there oh wow it's like your schedule was even crazier at that time it's all that 
I discovered 4 a.m. is this window where you can get stuff done. I just woke up at 4 a.m. for five years and got everything done, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the reason I, I mentioned it because uh, Anne's class, at least for us, was very, very early. And uh, like the first class and everyone was editing all night is so sleepy, but <laughs> and uh, has such a... Uh, big energy in the mornings and so entertaining and active and uh, so we couldn't we couldn't fall asleep uh, it was very interesting um, I uh, came to the program because my good friend uh, Olga Lubov with whom we already uh, directed and produced uh, Busy Inside um, the, my recent documentary uh, she came to the program one year before me uh, and so um I was looking for documentary film programs because in Russia I studied journalism and I worked uh, as a writer producer for TV. Uh, but I was really interested in storytelling and the bigger genre that gives you like more artistic freedom to express yourself. And of course, it's much more complicated. But um, I felt like I tried out and I came just for an, to see a lesson. Actually, it was Anne's class. Uh, and um, after that, I made the decision to apply. So Welcome to Chechnya is, if, you, if our viewers aren't familiar with it, is a documentary about members of the LGBTQ community living in Chechnya who are fleeing the country because it's a very oppressive regime there um, that the the leader basically despises members of that community so it, it's almost a thriller as we watch these people flee the country so as you know as chechnya is a part of russia and you yourself are russian and a member of the lgbtq community i'd love to hear your experience uh working on that and how how connected you you were to it yeah so um i came in on board um uh, uh, because I met I met David Franz, the director, and he told me um, about the project. And then it turned out that they don't have uh, a Russian-speaking um, person on the editing team. Uh, and the editor Tyler Walk, um, he couldn't start actually before everything is translated and kind of assembled. Uh, so my first role was to watch all 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 the footage uh, that they shot. And uh, they had the incredible access because they were able to uh, film inside the shelters where the activists from uh, Moscow, where LGBT activists was actually uh, hiding people who flee from Chechnya and then um, transfer them uh, to other countries. Because it has to be an underground operation because uh, uh, in Chechnya, uh, it's 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 also a very deep rooted uh, kind of phenomenon. Then that, that they have a uh, like this this uh, understanding of shame that can only be washed by blood. And actually, uh, being a part of the LGBT community is very shameful. And so they send sometimes they send relatives even after after uh, the refugees to uh, kill them. So it's a really, really um, dangerous operation. And of course, the people who were in the shelter came through uh, a lot of trauma, like being betrayed by their families or you know, being invited to a wedding. And then like a uh, Chechen singer, Zelim Bakayev, and he came uh, and then he was basically ambushed by his own family and uh, allegedly killed. Um, so I uh, would say that it's a little bit unusual for me to watch um, all this footage and uh, because I, in Moscow and in Russian territory, uh, main Russian territory, it's a little bit different. It's still conservative, but it's not uh, like as mind-blowingly uh, horrifying because, you know, uh, there are tortures involved, people get abducted, uh, Besides the threat from their families, they also been abducted and tortured in, in secret jails, um, and some of them did not survive. And like um, they were tortured so they could tell m more people, like 
uh, about more people and bring more people. And unfortunately, Chechen government often does such uh, missions where they pick a minority, no matter which one, and uh, kind of target it and attack it to, and to prove uh, their own power. Um, and uh, I think it was uh, kind of uh, probably the hardest was to go through this footage and to you kind of try to be distant and to have some sort of um, distance, yeah, and see it through the lens of the camera. But of course, it's like triggers you, and it's something that's like very close to my uh, heart. And I, uh, I know that's uh, uh, some of members of the team also are receiving. Um, therapy after after the production ended because they also other Russian speaking members were also very affected by it. Yeah, it's an extraordinary documentary and and the editing, like I said, it won a special editing award at Sundance um, that isn't an award that's given out every year. Um, it, it's completely riveting and and touching and uh, it's hard. To, it is hard to watch, and I can understand why people would need therapy, working on it or watching it afterwards. But that being said, I still do encourage people to watch it. Uh, if nothing else, it's very enlightening about uh, what is going on there, and that this is this is still happening. Um, and another, you know, another very dramatic documentary, the the pharmacist. Um, it it focuses on. Uh, the drug ec epidemic at large, um, both an experience uh, with the crack ec epidemic and then it goes into the opioid epidemic. Um, this is docu-series on Netflix. It's, uh, it's in four parts for about an hour long parts. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about, because this is the first docu-series you've worked on, can you talk about the major differences between editing a series and working with a team of, of three and versus working on a documentary feature? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, the Pharmacist was a different experience for me. I was working with Claire Ave Lallemont and Aaron Yeans, who are very talented, passionate editors. It was three editors on the project, um, which is really different than kind of coming on to something on your own. Um, they had started before I came on to the project. I came on right when they were sending their, um, I think they were sending their selects reel. So like a sample of all of their footage laid out in it more or less sort of the chronology of the film to uh, Netflix for approval. And I came on uh, to help them craft the first rough cut and I stayed on through picture lock, uh, which is when you're done with the editing process. Um, it was wonderful. Uh, it was great to have, uh, there was so much footage involved in that project. And it was such a long uh, uh, amount of screen time, you know, because it's four hours long, that it was great to have two other minds and two other sets of eyes, um, you know, in addition to producers and uh, directors uh, who were coming in and out, of course. Um, but it was really nice to have colleagues uh, in the editing room where they were in, you know, adjacent editing rooms who could say, you know, I just saw something and it's got a little tiny American flag in the corner. I pulled it for you and I put it in a bin and it's in your computer now, you know, because we were sharing media. Or to say, you know, how did you handle this? How are you handling, you know, there were a lot of moments of, you know, death or chase scenes or there's a lot of ups and downs in the pharmacist and ju to just see how they were handling things in other parts of the story. Um, the other big difference in a series compared to, um, you know, an independent documentary, which is anywhere from an hour to 90 minutes to 100 minutes long, is that you, um, and Victor knows this from um, my class, we always look for a three-act structure, you know, and the three-act structure goes back to Greek theater and Greek poetry and Aristotle, but we always look for that three-act structure for a beginning, a middle, and an end. And within that structure, as an editor, as a documentary film editor, you're looking at that structure and you're looking for moments that you can kind of heighten to give you, you know, an event that happens that spins your characters into the next scene. It's something screenwriters work with in feature filmmaking and fiction filmmaking, but it's what documentary film editors are always looking at, how to shape the chaos of you know, the ordinary everyday life into a story, you know, um, into a storytelling tradition that audiences plug into, um, that we're all kind of programmed to plug into. So 
when you're working on a series, you have to have that three act structure in every episode. Every episode has a beginning, middle, and an end. But you can't completely end the story. You've got to pitch your episode into the next episode. So you've got to kind of have these three act structures recur over time without fatiguing kind of the story, if that makes sense. So you're, um, you know, it's a little bit more of a marathon or maybe a, a triathlon or something like that because you're working on working and crafting one episode, but then you're constantly thinking about how is that going to inform what's coming next or how what you're working on is informed by what precedes it, what's going on in the episode previous to the one that you're working on, what's being set up, what seeds are being planted, and how are you going to kind of cultivate that. So it's, um, you know, it's a longer um, process. Um, it's, it, it's sort of a broader field to have to think about. Um, so it's, it's great to have uh, strong collaborators on that. Um, and we had a lot of, it was a wonderful team. The entire team was wonderful. Um, you know, from the directors to the producers to the assistant editors, we had a great post-production supervisor on board, you know, making sure that every piece of footage was accounted for and that the graphics were coming in and, you know, kind of pushing the graphics team to, you know, really create stuff that was, that, that, that told stories in ways that maybe the archival footage or the, or the verite footage couldn't. Um, but it's, it's a much bigger effort and it's just really, really nice to have, um, you know, support and company on something like that. That's great. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit more about documentary editing specifically um, beyond just, you know, the, the work you've been doing recently. You know, for me, from my understanding, narrative film, you're working with a script. And yes, you might have many takes of the same scene, but you're still following a script and the director is choosing which takes he, he wants. And, you know, but for documentary editing, you're piecing together... Um, not only different, potentially different takes from different interview from interviews, but hours upon hours of interviews, B-roll, archival, and found footage. You have, you know, in the pharmacist, there's a lot of audio tapes and and reenactments as well. Um, and so, you know, and the same goes for Welcome to Chechnya and the other documentaries you've worked on, Victor. Um, so, in that case, I assume that the editor or editors have a much stronger say, as it were, almost maybe to the same level as the director in shaping how the story uh, eventually is seen. Do you share that opinion or do you, um, I mean, I'd really just love to hear what, what you would have to say about that. I think definitely in documentary filmmaking, the editor has a lot more, uh, I don't want to say power, but like input uh, into how the story will be shaped. And uh, oftentimes the producers and the directors, they have in mind a certain concept, but uh, just because they were so close to the story, they, they, they couldn't really see that maybe in the footage there is something stronger or it's better to focus on the other character actually to, to uh, so that the point comes across. And uh, I think that's just the editor, it's a lot of just feeling, like while, while watching the footage, it's just like feeling where, where the story is and um, intuitively kind of, I guess, uh, finding these pieces of the puzzle and also the whole picture of the puzzle also changes several times because you start, you have this, one direction you go and then maybe in the rough cut stage you rethink it, rethink the chronology or um, like really, really dig in what the film is about. I think that's um, uh, working on the structure is essential. Like in Ant's class, we work with index cards and since then I also have the board here with index cards, but <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I think that's, uh, you know, for Welcome to Chechen, especially uh, the editor and, and myself we were very involved into like all this, into these cards uh, in a different order, different order, different order till you, till it clicks. Uh, so I think that the, the overall vision uh, is the director's kind of, but but get into this vision in all those different ways, it's definitely the editor's uh, responsibility. 
Nan? Yeah, I, I, you know, I agree with you there. Um, you know, I sometimes feel like it's, um, you know, there's that fairy tale Rumpelstiltskin where somebody's locked in a tower and there's all this straw and they have to spin it into gold by morning. You know, I often feel like that's the situation you're in as an editor. It's usually not life-threatening, thank goodness. But, um, but it is this strange kind of alchemical task that you have to kind of perform. Um, and I think, you know, Victor's, you know, using the language I would use that it's a director has a vision, you know, has been moved by something, has put a tremendous amount of energy and effort into capturing a story. Um, and when you come into the editing room, you have the editor has this fresh perspective on things and this fresh take on things and enters into this wonderful conversation, this collaborative conversation with a, di with a director, listening to sort of what they're excited about and what they see and how they see it. And then you are tasked with the job of um, literally telling the story. And when I say telling the story, I mean finding, you know, um, you know, the image of the sun rising that starts the film or whatever you're going to use, um, you know, somebody working at something or somebody, you know, feet running or the sound of water or whatever it is, you know, how do you come up with once upon a time? What is that? How do you translate concepts like that into cinematic terms? And so the editor kind of takes this chaos of enthusiasm that comes into the editing room, you know, in the form of media in the form of images and sounds and, hashes through all of that and processes all of that and processes it, you know, in their minds as well as on screen and starts putting it together and starts shaping things. People think editing is about extraction, but it's actually about addition. It's about shaping things and putting things into a certain order and a certain sequencing, a certain chain of events that brings to light that vision and, 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 you know, does it in an aesthetic, in a way that aesthetically matches the subject um, and in a way that has, you know, some kind of emotional impact on an audience that's very specific and unique to cinema. And that's um, also kind of, um, kind of magical because it's, 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 it's nonfiction. It's, it's, it's something that really happened. It's sort of taking the chaos of the world and translating it into cinema, which is, which is no small task in shaping it. Now, uh, Anne, you've uh, you've mainly been an editor. You've also produced. Uh, have Have you ever directed, or do you do you hope to direct at some point, or you're mainly focused on editing? I, you know, it's really funny. I adore editing. I love that when I sit down in the morning as an editor, I start telling the story. And when I, you know, when it's the end of the day or the evening or whenever I'm stopping, um, I am telling the story all day long. I've been just thinking about the story and how to tell the story and how the story is shaping up. I went to um, an undergrad film program and, you know, had to do everything, had to produce and had to do sound and had to shoot. And I do not like standing outside in the freezing cold. So that eliminated a great deal of jobs in the film industry for me. Um, I really like being indoors, like with a cup of tea and a computer. Um, I'm that kind of person. Um, I also am a person, uh, as, as somebody once said to me, I am a person who needs to earn a living. Um, and editing is a craft, you know, that allows you to work for a long stretch of time, you know, for months on end. And I just have a, a, a life situation that requires that. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. And, you know, Victor, um, you recently directed, uh, directed a film. So it, it's, it, to me, looks like, you know, you've directed, produced, edited. Is, is there one position on the film that you like? Do you like to have more control as a director? Or, you know, have you sort of found a niche in editing? Or are you still trying a lot of things out? Uh, I think it really depends because uh, in the program we were also tasked with making our own films and we were, I think each of us was kind of ambitious towards like being uh, a director, right? But the director needs to learn all these other crafts. And, uh, but I think the mentality after the program still stays like you kind of overall you have, um, uh, you can be involved in any part of this process. And even if some people focus on just filming or editing, I know many examples and 
uh, among professors as well, where they have the editing phase and then they go back to producing phase, like they direct on their own project, but at the same time, they work as story consultant or an editor for another project. And I feel like that's, that's the reality. And more, moreover, like uh, right now, we've uh, with busy inside. Uh, you know, we feel we made about people with multiple personality disorder. Uh, we are in distribution stage, and it's also a kind of you on your on your own because even with films uh, agents, uh, you you have to do a lot of work and learn about it. So you kind of become this entrepreneur suddenly, and uh, you know learn about self distribution and stuff. And I feel like all these processes are very creative. They're all uh, interconnected. And uh, yes, lately, like for a few years, I've been focusing on editing, but I, uh, I totally see myself like doing everything at once or a few years, that few, few years, another thing. I think it's just natural stream of things in, in industry. That's great. Um, and you've been working in documentary films since, uh, since the mid 90s. Uh, have you seen the field change over time? And and specifically, um, you know, as a woman working in the field, have you ever encountered any challenges? And hopefully those have gotten better throughout the years, but I'd love to hear your take on that. Sure. Um, when I started editing the first film I cut, I cut on 16 millimeter film. Um, so I started just before... Um, digitized filmmaking, uh, specifically like the Avid or Premiere or Final Cut came into being. Um, so it was a very tactile craft when I started. Um, and it, it was sort of, there were more people in the editing room. I, I started as an apprentice film editor, and then I worked my way up to an assistant film editor, and then I started editing. And the whole time that I was working in those um, you know, sort of early positions, I was in a room with an editor and a director silently, you know, hearing their conversations and, and hearing, because my back was usually to the editor, hearing the film develop and watching the film develop. You know, they'd stop and screen and we'd stop what we were doing to be quiet and we'd watch rough cuts. And, you know, I was learning by osmosis that way, which was really wonderful. Um, and sort of the craft was handed down when the director wasn't there, the editor might give you something to cut or might be trying to solve a problem and might kind of have a eureka moment and turn and go, oh, I just figured out how to do it. Look and show you what to do or give you small tasks to do and kind of mentor you through that. One of the reasons I was excited to teach at the School of Visual Arts is because with the advent of, um, you know, computer-based editing systems, um, the, the assistant isn't present in the room anymore with the director and the editor. And the craft, I thought that that tradition of handing down the craft was disappearing and um, people were learning software and confusing that with learning craft. And I, because I came of age, you know, I worked at the Maisels and I worked for a lot of independent filmmakers, George Butler um, and, and some great editors uh, who were handing that craft down to me. I worried that that was going to disappear, that a lot of the kind of nuanced things about documentary film editing that you might not notice, that you hopefully don't notice when you're watching a film, you know, we're going to kind of die out, um, you know, uh, as, as the technology changed. Um, so that mentorship has been a problem, which is why film schools are wonderful uh, things uh, and, and, you know, workshops and, 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 you know, festivals and things like that bring people together, bring craft people together in every domain. I think that's true of, you know, a lot of domains of producing and um, directing, uh, you know, as well. Um, and cinematography as well, that handing down of craft. Um, but the other thing that's changed recently is that with um, streaming platforms, um, you know, we're in sort of this uh, early golden age of the series, you know. Um, uh, things are, you know, people are, I mean, especially in this moment um, when we're still in semi-lockdown with COVID-19, we're, we're home and we're binge watching, right? And so stories, um, a lot of the stories that are, that are being um, funded uh, and a lot of stories that are being told are longer in scope. They're, they're episodic and they're, um, you know, there's so many documentary series being made in addition to individual, you know, 90 minute, 100 minute films that are being made. So there's a, you know, there's, there are so many um, forms of the genre kind of, you know, branching off and, and, and evolving at this moment. Uh, and that's changed a lot. So. 
Well, speaking of the pandemic, and and Victor will bounce back to you. You know, you've you've had a, a great year. You've had several films uh, that have that have come out that you worked uh, you worked on in different capacities. Um, I mentioned, you know, besides Welcome to Chechnya, uh, we have Busy Inside, which you noted, which you uh, which you produced, and then uh, Two and Twenty Troubles, which you directed, and Secret Music, which um, which you edited. Um, can you talk about, uh, especially some of those films that aren't widely distributed yet, um, can you talk about where they've gone thus far uh, this year to any festivals and if they're going to be widely distributed or if there's a place that we can find them online? And additionally, tell us, uh, tell us what you've been up to during the pandemic, how you've been working and if, what we can uh, look for from you next. Um, I um, I think this year was for me a year of distribution because so many projects were uh, finalized, but then you, as a filmmaker, you need to try to find the audience and get it out, and it's really, really hard unless you, you know, um, Sundance, uh, in Sundance competition, and many of us just not so it's 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 really challenging and it's always uh, it's on your shoulders and you kind of have to figure out um how how to uh, make your film visible um amongst many many other projects uh, so you know we've we've joined uh, this year we've joined new day uh, films filmmakers Corp, uh, where it's i think it's a really exciting opportunity because filmmakers help each other to uh, distribute their films and to contact libraries to go to conferences to go to universities and um, they have a catalog that they all kind of uh, trying to promote um, and it's it's something new in the industry and you know uh, I think uh, it's very important to be a part of this networking um, communities because since I finished the program uh, you you kind of you for a while you feel a little bit isolated because you've had all this community just you know uh, sitting around in the editing suites and um, you could go to the corridor and chat about your, your movie but then you kind of lose it for a bit and you need to as a state in touch which could be difficult or uh you know find find a place where you're always kind of inspired by others and pushed by others and you can ask for help uh, another organization i also joined this year was documentary producers alliance uh which which is great they're doing a lot of work to um to make to try to make filmmaking sustainable uh, mm. and uh, for like a career, uh, because it's also a huge problem, especially for documentary filmmakers. They have to invest their own money and uh, be just enthusiastic about what they're doing. And maybe later they maybe will sell, maybe not. So they lose lots of, lose their wealth and they lose, some, um, you know, they, frankly it can be in debt like it's very it's 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 a very competitive and um, i i think it's it's great that there are organizations that are trying to find new ways to produce and smarter ways to find sponsors and uh, do fundraising and development but the biggest project that we were supposed to do during the pandemics is our next project was all the above it's uh, working titles from time to time and um, it was supposed to be in russia and five different regions and we would uh, go and see uh, traditional new year celebration of different ethnic and religious groups from buddhist and siberia to cult of the dead and middle russian muslim and christian um and it would be like this screenshot of russia which i think uh, oftentimes this is an unseen Russia for, for an American audience and um, which they, they don't know much about uh, but at the same time very similar country in terms of diversity and uh, you know just this vast multicultural uh, geography um, and uh, we've been we were supposed to film in May, but just because of the pandemics now, like all, all this pushed, um, maybe hopefully to 2021. So we'll see. Well, I hope that pans out. It sounds like a very interesting, uh, interesting topic. And Anne, are you working right now during during the pandemic? 
I am on a, on a film. <laughs> I am, yeah, I am. I am working on my tan. No, I am working on a film. Um, I've been really lucky. I've been working on a project about Miami Lighthouse for the Blind, um, which is being produced by Simon Plus Films, and Deborah Dixon is directing it. Victor knows Deborah very well, um, and that's been delightful. But we are, you know, it's uh, we've been cutting uh, a foot our footage. It's a verite documentary, and there are sort of final scenes with each character that we were scheduled to shoot in the middle of March, like, uh, you know, March 16th, 17th, 18th were big shoot days for us. That whole week were big shoot days. And, and if you think about those dates, March 15th was the day that New York City was put into lockdown and none of our crew, you know, in the week leading up to that were able to commit to flying to Miami. It's being filmed in Miami. Miami's in lockdown. So that whole story is, we'll, you know, get our endings for our characters, but um, when we'll get them is a question. Uh, so that, that's been affected by the pandemic. Um, in the meantime, I'm finishing up another project called um, Bill T. Jones, Can You Bring It?, which is being directed by Tom Hurwitz and Rosalind LeBlanc. Um, and that's the story of Bill T. Jones, uh, the great American choreographer Bill T. Jones, and his um, uh, his his um, masterpiece uh, "D Man in the Waters," which is a dance that he made uh, during the AIDS epidemic when he was grieving his partner and lover Arnie Zane, um, who who succumbed to AIDS. You know. Um, in the months before he made it. They had secured funding to make this dance and Arnie passed away and Bill was left alone uh, to create this dance. And so uh, tells the story of how art making uh, kind of lifted him, kind of carried him through his grief um, and, and, you know, as well as his company, the dancers in his company, how working on this very difficult dance uh, sustained them and brought them together and gave them a place to come and to collectively grieve. So been a really fun project. Well, we'll keep an eye out for those in, in the coming years. Um, both uh, both Anne and Victor have uh, IMDb, IMDb profiles, which list um, their full credits. So if you're interested in, in what they've worked on, I encourage you to check that out. And most, most of their films can be found online. Specifically, uh, Victor's website is diplodocusfilms.com, and we'll put that in the YouTube information. Um, but uh, and, so, and the films that are upcoming that he mentioned uh, are are listed on there. Victor, you know, you gave some good tips about how to stay involved with other documentarians and filmmakers during the pandemic, which I think is great. Do you have any other advice that you'd like to offer students or people who are interested in breaking into this field and maybe specifically editors right now? And, you know, as we're facing a pandemic, but, but maybe more, more broadly about, about breaking in and how to, uh, how to find work in documentaries. Well, think twice before you <laughs> go, in, go into, but if you actually have this passion uh, for storytelling and documentary films, I think the best way uh, is to um, to meet people. And like for me, it was to assist, like I mentioned, assist really great editors, Paul Lapp, Rappaport, and Tyler Walk, and uh, David Bartner. And I think they all like, really helped me like I was insisting on <laughs> on giving me some scenes you know uh, talking to them about what they did during the day uh, cutting for them cutting some extra sequence to show them that I found and uh, I think this way you really really learn a lot and uh, if you have an editor who and most of them are very friendly and supportive then probably you'll have great conversations and from there you'll see uh, you, you'll be able to master your editing skills. And, and Anne, besides taking your class, uh, what other advice would you, would you recommend for students or folks who are interested in breaking into the field? Well, you know, uh, Victor was my student. He was a wonderful student and his editing work was, you know, he, he was very passionate about editing. He was very um, meticulous and concise and creative when it came to editing. But what Victor did that was so smart is when he finished the program, he let me know that he wanted to work as an editor. And he um, sent me emails. Uh, we sometimes saw each other at industry events or social events. Um, and, you know, he 
you know, and Victor, I hope you still will now that you're a big editor, uh, you know, would drop me an email and say, I'm looking for work, you know, and Victor was such a dear student, you know, I was more than happy. I was delighted to hear this. And sometimes when you're a freelance uh, worker of any, you know, in any capacity in this business, you might be a little bit busy, but just getting that little note that says, hey, I'm looking for work or think of me, or if you know anybody who's looking, it's, it's all you need. And then, you know, maybe a week or a month or whatever, at some point, somebody will send you, you know, I'll get a text from somebody saying, I need somebody and I'll say, you know, Victor, you know. Um, uh, Thank and, you. Yeah, oh no, I love Victor. You know how I feel about you, but, um, it, it's really nice to do that. Uh, and, and I always encourage students um, to to maintain that community, you know, to stay in touch with each other um, because, you know, you might have a friend in film school who goes in one direction for a while and then circles back to something that intersects more with what you're doing. Um, and I think Victor has been great at maintaining his social connections, you know, with a sincerity to want to stay in touch with the people that he's close to. But I also think that that's a, you know, I have some of my, you know, most of my best friends are editors just because we have so much in common. Um, but forming community is really important, you know, whether it's, you know, through social media or, you know, someday when we can all see each other again, that's important. Um, I also sometimes get emails out of the blue from assistant editors just introducing themselves, who've maybe watched my work. I think that's a good idea. When I was um, first freelancing, um, I wasn't hearing about fabulous jobs. I was hearing about, you know, what we sometimes call as bread and butter gigs. But I would recommend editors whose work I really admired to other producers in the hopes that they would then recommend me in turn. And I think that's a great way to, um, to kind of build a network you know, I would sometimes, at one point I was recommending a very big editor who did not know me for tons of work that was beneath her. And she eventually sent me an email and said, oh my gosh, thank you so much, whoever you are, for recommending me for all of these jobs and started recommending me for work. So, you know, just, it's about community and about sharing, you know, not kind of keeping your jobs to yourself. You know, if, if I'm working on something and I hear about another job, I really want to recommend it to someone, you know, whom, you know, I admire someone, you know, uh, that I know and admire. Uh, I want us all to be working. I think of it that way. I don't think of it as a competition. I think of it as a, a collaborative community. And have you two ever worked on the same project yet? Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Ho hopefully, hopefully In soon. The future. Um, Although I did recommend Victor to one of my dearest friends to the great filmmaker and editor Paula Rappaport, who I know from my days at Maisel's. I've known Paula since, you know, I was an undergrad and uh, she was looking for someone and I would only recommend somebody really special to Paula because she's so dear to me. And I said, Victor, and she adored him, you know, uh, and I think that she was great. That was a good show. Uh, yeah, she's wonderful. But I think that was pretty soon out of the program. She was looking for someone. And I was like, Victor, 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 Victor. You know, she was like, can I meet him? I was like, you don't have to, but you can, you know. Uh, and that worked out really well. Um, so. Well, that's great. Um, I Well, hopefully the two of you do get the chance to work together at some point. Um, I would love, love that. I'd love to see yeah. that piece. Um, I really can't recommend uh, either documentary enough. Both of them are both films, specifically the, the newest ones that we're, we've been talking about, The Pharmacist on Netflix and uh, Welcome to Chechnya on HBO are completely riveting and I strongly encourage you to check them out. We'll provide links in the information below this video. Um, I wanna thank both Anne and Victor for being here today. Uh, I thought the information you provided was terrific and I wish you the best of luck on your current and future projects. And I encourage everyone to check out the other films uh, that we've mentioned throughout this, uh, throughout this interview. Uh, I think that their work is really outstanding and uh, congratulations to both of you on your films. And we can't wait to see more from you. So thank you again for being here. Thank you, Adam. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed this Q&A and hope you'll check out our other after school special videos on the School of Visual Arts' YouTube channel. Thank you for your interest in and support of SVA and its alumni. 
and for your support of the arts in general. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be well.